based on the original version of The Hobbit, did they forget the word book? The Hobbit might seem an odd choice of adaptation for the company that was mostly known for Christmas specials, especially when Tolkien himself wrote a separate Christmas mythology, but that had only just been published and it wasn't in the public domain. The Hobbit was, at the time, in the US only, due to a screw up from publishers. I have mixed feelings about that because as much as I support the public domain, I think it's unfair when an author's ownership over their work is taken from them because somebody else did something dumb. But the weird loophole that placed the books in the public domain was closed later, so the books are no longer in the public domain in the US, which I have even more complicated feelings about. Like, yeah, the circumstances that place him in the public domain were unfair, but the precedent that things can be taken out of the public domain is really unsettling. Why yes, as a matter of fact, it is a constant struggle to reconcile my love of the public domain with my love of Disney stuff. Why do you ask? But complicated circumstances aside, the fact is, at the time, The Hobbit and Lord of the Rings were in the public domain in the US, but not internationally. So for an adaptation that the Tolkien estate didn't authorize, a big theatrical film that wouldn't be able to play overseas was probably not the best call. So instead, this was a made-for-TV special aired on NBC, but with plans to release it to theaters locally if the ratings were good enough. While the special definitely has a lot of the hallmarks of cheap television animation, with a $3 million budget, it was actually the most expensive television production in history at the time. Guess it's just really hard to do an affordable version of Middle-earth no matter what you do. The character designs are… something alright. They made a point of being true to any physical descriptions in the book, but that still gave them a lot of freedom to do… this to Bilbo. You know, make him look like a cross between a Keebler elf and E.T. But hey, on some of the posters his design is even worse. Gah! Giant albino bullfrog! Maybe that's not Bilbo, maybe it's actually Smeagol, and that's why Gollum looks so amphibious. Still, no design in this special is uglier than the Wood Elves. Good God! I hope Legolas takes after his mom's side of the family! I guess they just really wanted to distinguish themselves from the elves they were already known for. Nobody's gonna mistake these guys for Hermie. But despite a few questionable character design choices, I really love the background arc, which is all like kinda realistic, but kinda stylized and completely beautiful. And it's no wonder considering the things the overseas animators responsible for this film would go on to do. As for some of the other stylistic choices, I keep going back and forth on that spiraling out thing characters do when they get killed. I can never decide if I love it or hate it. I don't know. What do you think? Let's talk. As for the writing, it's… rushed. The characters mostly get reduced to the broadest archetypical versions of their characters from the book. Bilbo is fussy. Dwarves have a strange notion of perfection. Thorin is grumpy. A splendid lucky number you found for us. Bomber is fat. And uh, Bombo at your service. The rest of the dwarves are there too. Mr. Baggins. Bilbo. And Gandalf just seems mysterious for mysterious' sake in a way that's just unhelpful. Like, okay, much has been written about how the Gandalf of the Hobbit is more of a general mysterious old wizard trope than his more complex and grounded portrayal in Lord of the Rings, but reading The Hobbit, I still got the sense that he's, like, a character whose actions are motivated, even if the motivations are sometimes unclear to Bilbo and the dwarves. In this movie, not so much. If the secret door is hidden, how do we find it? The map doesn't tell. It does, and it doesn't. Huh? You will understand in time. Dude, if you don't know, you can just say that. And then when he's not being vague, it seems like he only cares about furthering Bilbo's development. Like he's making big moves for the sole purpose of Bilbo's self-actualization. Like he's some sort of manic wizard dream Gandalf. Now, now, I am already late because of bothering with you people. I am sending Mr. Baggins with you. That should be enough. The burglar? Me? I'm no equal to a wizard. Nonsense. You are the lucky number. And soon you'll find out there's more about you than you guess. You don't really suppose, do you, that all your adventures and escapes were managed by mere luck? 
just for your sole benefit? No, he believes that you orchestrated everything just for his sole benefit. You made choices just because they would drive his arc, not because you have anything else going on in Middle-earth. Also, Gandalf seems to know the whole time that Bilbo has a magic ring. Your story, Bilbo, has the ring of truth. Yes, it rings true. Okay, fair. In the book, Bilbo did wonder if Gandalf guessed the part he let out, and I think that's a fun way of adapting that note. But Gandalf seems to know already that it's the One Ring? Oh, Bilbo Baggins. If you really understood that ring, uh, someday members of your family not yet born will. Then you'd realize that this story has not ended, but is only beginning. You are uncharacteristically chill about that. I guess having the most evil item in the universe resurface is just, you know, cute and quirky as long as it can teach Bilbo another lesson. So with the writing so rushed, most of the characterization is left to the voice actors, and to the movie's credit, there is a murderer's row of comedians and voice talent from the era. If you can accept the fact that the denizens of Middle-earth have American accents. Orson Bean is solid as Bilbo, his fussiness comes across beautifully. Eggs and bacon, a good full pipe, my garden at twilight, cakes. When he's not being bogged down with wildly stilted dialogue. I'm a quiver with anticipation. And while it's kinda hard to accept anyone other than Andy Serkis in the role anymore, I think Brother Theodore is a pretty good golem. Yes, my precious. Is it juicy, gooey, yucky? Is it scrumptious? And Hans Conried as Thor in Oakenshield is inspired. Who better to capture a cartoonified version of the Dwarf King's indignance and greed than Captain Hook? Curses to the dragon, curses to Smog. He killed our men and stole our gold. And another Captain Hook, Cyril Richard, plays Elrond. Sadly, he passed away only a few weeks after this production aired, so this was his final role, but while it's brief, he plays it well. Yes, of course. Well, first of all, they're not troll make. They must have been stolen. Paul Freeze does a few additional voices, and Thurl Ravenscroft does some singing, and Dave does Disney fans know how I feel about that wonderful combination. As for Gandalf, you're always going to need someone with real gravitas. But this is just a made-for-TV cartoon, so I'm afraid that all we can get is John Houston. So, tomorrow begins your greatest adventure. <laughs> yeah, Hollywood legend John Houston, the guy whose directorial debut was the Maltese freaking Falcon, the guy who played the evil creep in that movie directed by the other evil creep. And amazingly, this was not his only influence on a Tolkien adaptation although the others were long after his death. He had a little bit of an influence on the Jackson movies. Look at some John Huston, his tree beard without the fungus looks like John Huston a bit. And one of my favorite Lord of the Rings parodies draws heavily from his work. What is it, Gandalf? It's the ring, Frodo. It must be taken and thrown into the fire in Mount Doom. Hmm, all right. Of course, some characters are cut altogether, notably Bayorn, and there are simplifications throughout the story, some of them really minor, like dropping the Durin's Day concept from the secret door, and some much bigger, like removing the Arkenstone. Okay, I fully understand why the Arkenstone thread seemed expendable in the name of condensing the story, but I do feel like it was one of the fatal errors here. Without that element, Bilbo and Thorin's argument at the end doesn't seem like a major betrayal on Bilbo's part, causing the friendship to rupture permanently. It just seems like more of the same squabbling they've been doing the whole time. Wear it proudly, and it will carry you to victory. Confusticate and be bother victory. My only hope is to be taken prisoner as quickly as possible. Those are the words of a coward. The coward who always went forward while you cringed behind? You don't see us cringing now, do you? And when it just seems like more of the same, the deathbed reconciliation is far less meaningful. Farewell, good thief. I wish to part in friendship. And then there are other scenes that I have to assume were written, but were deleted after the fact. Run to the Wood Elves' clearing. Never mind the fact that the audience never once saw us discover the Wood Elves' clearing, we just know about it. But what really makes me sad about the condensed writing is how much of the humor of the book really suffers. As Bilbo and Gandalf's good morning conversation is cut, as is the comic build of the dwarves slowly arriving and overwhelming poor Bilbo. Instead, they go for... 
mysterious and spooky. Enough. I am Gandalf. And Gandalf means me. Gandalf? Not the wandering wizard. We must away at break of day. Mysterious and spooky isn't a terrible choice of tone overall, but man, do I miss the book's humor. In one case, they not only cut out the funny part of the book, but in doing so, they fundamentally change what Gandalf's powers are. Rather than tricking the trolls into arguing with each other until sunrise, Gandalf just makes the sun come up. Dawn, take you all, and be stoned. Man, that's a hell of a power. I knew you were the wielder of the flame of Anor, but I didn't know you could control Anor. Did... Did this happen because the screenwriter misunderstood the line, The dawn comes early? How did the morning come so soon? That's not to say the movie is without its own sense of humor. The movie's sense of humor seems to mostly involve Bilbo whining, which is hit or miss. Thank you, but I'd appreciate a more pragmatic salute. In other words... EXTINGUISH ME! And Thorin using burgle as a verb, which gets old a little faster. Burglar? Do your burgling! Well, you are the burglar. Go down and burgle something. What did you burgle? Burglar, madam. That said, the ceasefire between the three armies as the goblins arrive is... Well, it's hilarious. I'm assuming that it's trying to be a comedy beat. Take their heads! Kill the men! Kill the elves! Oh, great elf king, my truest friend and ally, we must join our forces against this common scourge. But of course, O oh, noble king under the mountain, your people are like brothers unto mine. Together! Thorin is correct. I simply do not understand war. A side effect of some of the rushing is giving Bilbo more agency in minor ways, such as having him directly tell the Thrush to deliver the message to Bard, rather than the Thrush just overhearing it and deciding to give the message to Bard. You have seen Smog. You know his vulnerable spot. Go now to Lake Town. There is a guardsman, Bard. Tell him. Never mind how I know that you can talk to Bard. Just go about it. And earlier than that, Bilbo actively chooses to ask Gollum what he has in his pocket, rather than accidentally asking it, which really sucks. Like, Bilbo accidentally stumbling into asking a non-riddle, and that being what ends up saving him, that is funny stuff, and it's true to his character. But Bilbo deliberately asking a non-riddle in a riddles game? What have I got in my pocket? Not here! Not here! To us, my precious, what it's got in its nasty little pocket is this. I'm sorry, that's my riddle. And if you can't guess it, you lose. That sucks, you're a no good cheater, Baggins. They also remove the moment where Bilbo almost kills Gollum after that. They just have Bilbo run away without trying to kill him. Ta-ta! I presume they changed that to keep the story kid-friendly, but... I feel like we lose a lot there. The pity that stays Bilbo's hand is one of the most pivotal moments in the history of Middle-earth. The fact that Bilbo chose Mercy may not make much of a difference in this story specifically, but it changes everything that follows, and it's hard to feel like an authentic Middle-earth adaptation without that moment. Also, this is definitely the revised version of Riddles in the Dark, so the opening credits really had no business saying based on the original version. Peggy's. Look, I know, changing things is just a natural element of adaptation. And trimming things for time? I may not agree with every change, but I at least understand why they do it. And then there are some changes here that... I can't even necessarily say they're bad. I just don't know why they made these changes. Well, first of all, they're not troll make. Why does Elrond have a beard? Even half-elves aren't exactly known for their beards. There are moon letters here. Those aren't the moon letters. Those are the runes that say five feet high the door and three may walk abreast. The script knew this because Bilbo referenced them earlier despite them not being visible. This hand points from these uh, runes. Yep, I see these runes, these very runes. Look at them. 
That ring is way more ornate than the ring as described in the book. It's got, like, designs and stuff on it. There are moments which can change a person for all time. And I suddenly wondered if I would ever see my snug hobbit hole again. I wondered if I actually wanted to. That is not the attitude Bilbo had climbing the tree in the book. No. You left the cells unlocked when you freed the dwarves from the Wood Elves dungeon? You didn't lock the doors and return the keys so they would think the dwarves have a very strong magic to pass through all those locked doors and disappear? I mean, I guess I get it as visual shorthand for they're all free now, but huh. Sorry, Sorry you could not find me, but a fine burglar, burglar takes, takes expert, expert catching. <laughs> burglar? you show yourself to Smaug? Even in all your growth and newfound bravery, would you really be that cocky? A battle of four armies. One, two, three, yes, four. No, no, it's already five armies. The book counts the wargs as a second army separate from the goblins. The eagles! Five armies now? Actually, no, the eagles do not count as an army. I don't make the rules, take it up with Johnny Ronnie. What happened? We won. Bomber gone, too. Bomber died? He didn't die in the book. He lived on so that Tolkien could take some time out of Lord of the Rings Book 2, Chapter 1, Many Meetings to further fat shame him. Bomber was now so fat that he could not move himself from his couch to his chair at table, and it took six young dwarves to lift him. I'm not saying I want to keep the fat shaming, I'm just saying, why did you kill Bomber? Of our original 13, how many are left? Seven. Only Feely and Keely died in the battle! Wait, did you get that seven number from the aforementioned many meetings, where Glowin says that only seven of the original company remain? Because again, he specifically mentions Bomber as one of the remaining seven. Dwalin, Glowin, Dory, Nori, Beefer, Boffer, and Bomber! And Thorin? Soon there will be only six. Your seven living included, Thorin? You're killing more dwarves in one battle than Tolkien killed over 77 years? Man, Rankin Bass Productions just has some real dwarf bloodlust. I guess I shouldn't be surprised that they're Team Elf after all. So after discussing what this production removes and changes from the book, what does it add to the book? Well, mostly songs or that is mostly music for the songs that are already in the book. There is one brand new song, the theme song, The Greatest Adventure, sung by Glenn Yarborough, and yeah, I have a fondness for this, even if I think the sentiment is kind of simplistic, even for this story, but it has a charm that I can't deny. The greatest adventure is The rest of the songs have lyrics adapted by Jules Bass from Tolkien's original poetry, with music by Maury Laws. Most of the lyrical adaptation comes in the form of abridgment, although for In the Valley they straight up change the stanza structure. The line, and Balin and Dwalin, down into the valley in June, haha, -ha, gets changed to, and Balin and Dwalin in June. My dear Elrond, your hospitality is magnificent. Now I know what you're thinking right now, but, 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 what does that mean for the later stanza they were setting up a rhyme for? And listen and hark till the end of the dark to our tune, ha ha. Oh, they just cut that stanza. So, you know, solutions. Moving on from elves singing, uh, I have to note that Tolkien describes the goblin singing as croaking and that their songs sound truly terrifying and horrible. He paints the picture of a very unpleasant experience listening to the goblins sing about whipping and cracking. So naturally, the good people at Rankin Bass Productions decided to turn the goblin songs into absolute freaking jams. Oh, 
in a fiery breeze. These are the catchiest songs in the whole thing. They are awesome, they rock, they are completely tonally inappropriate for their places in the story, but I love them. Ask him to explain his weapon. <laughs> this sword is named Orchrist, the Goblin Cleaver. <laughs> Murderers! Elf friends! I do love how the goblins have squeaky speaking voices, but beautiful, rich, deep singing voices. Thurl paved the way for the latter-day career of Robert Goulet. The soundtrack album also includes a song that didn't make it into the film, Bilbo's Taunting of the Mirkwood Spiders. Hey Adderkop, hey Adderkop, you can't catch anybody. I'd be curious to see how this would have been integrated into the animation, assuming that that was ever the plan. Thing is, I've never been able to find a whole lot of behind-the-scenes info on the movie, which made it all the more fascinating to me when at a used bookstore, my family found this. A 1989 illustrated version of The Hobbit using illustrations from the Rankin Bass film. Appropriately enough, a literal Red Book of Westmarch. Although I'm sure it originally had a slipcover. But this is the unabridged text of the original book, featuring not only screenshots from the cartoon, but also concept art. So you get some slightly different character designs and some different colors, a shockingly high number of drawings of a green version of Smaug, and at one point in development, apparently the ring had a diamond on it, which would have been just plain sacrilegious. But there are also illustrations of some scenes that didn't make it into the movie. There's exactly one drawing of Bayorn in human form, one drawing in bear form, and a drawing of the gruesome fate of his victims. There's an illustration of the Arkenstone, and of Bilbo's meeting with Bard and Thranduil to hand it over. So were all these scenes animated and deleted? Or did they just make it to the concept art stage? Or were they never going to be in the movie and these were just drawn in the movie style for this book? I have no idea. But it's an interesting peek at what a more complete take on the story from this team might look like. I have a lot of fondness for this movie, but I don't think it does justice to the book. If The Hobbit was just another children's book, and this was just one of many adaptations of it, this would be fine. It's like, I don't know, Chuck Jones' version of The Cricket in Times Square. A cute cartoon based on a book you kinda remember reading as a kid. Unless your favorite book actually is Cricket in Times Square, in which case I apologize. Point is, I feel like if The Hobbit was just a standalone book, if this had been released before Lord of the Rings was written, this would feel a lot more serviceable than I find it right now.